Those were wonderful words and I think very inspiring and set up the, the symposium very well. We're going to turn now to our two plenary speakers and I'm just going to pull up the biography of our first speaker and make sure that she is connected and can share her slides. So our first plenary speaker is from Jamaica. Uh, Mrs. Wendy Harrison Smith is the manager of research and development at the National Water Commission of Jamaica. Prior to this position, Mrs. Smith was the quality assurance in the quality assurance section for over 16 years, where she served as a laboratory analyst for over 10 years, a senior technical officer, and a quality assurance manager for the Easton Laboratory. During her tenure. Um, in the quality assurance section, she worked with potable water and wastewater analysis, but has recently begun to explore the use of water uh, stable isotopes uh, or stable isotopes in, in water resources and water resource management. Mrs. Smith holds a, a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and microbiology from the University of West Indies and is now pursuing a master's in freshwater quality monitoring and assessment at the University uh, College of Cork. And she's going to speak about the, the role and the function of the National Water Commission today. And for our, our Canadian attendees, this will be most appreciated to give us some insights into Jamaica. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Just making sure. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, unfortunately, our president couldn't join this morning, and so I'll be presenting on his behalf. Um, let me see if I can share screen. Okay. And so um, th th this is about water, water portability and wastewater management in Jamaica and our role as the National um, Water Commission. So the National Water Commission is a statutory organization and we were established in 1980 through the amalgamation of the Kingston and St. Andrew Water Commission and the National Water Authority. We are governed by the NWC Act of 1980 within the context of the government of Jamaica. And we work with the water sector policy, which is aligned with our national development plans. The, water, the NWC is part of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation with the water sector comprising of eight agencies. Um, these agencies include our regulators, which are the Ministry of Health, Water Resources Authority, um, Office of Utility Regulations, the National Environmental Planning Agency, and we also have our partners who are the National Irrigation Council, as well as our ministries and um, relevant agencies. The NWC has primary responsibility for the supply of potable water as well as sewage services to our populace. As the number one service provider in Jamaica, we serve over 75% of the population through household connections and the remaining population, mostly in the rural areas, are served by small systems operated by the government through the parish council and also through private water companies. The NWC operates over 1,000 water supply facilities inclusive of pumping station, wells, and our rivers and springs. And we also have over 65 sewage facilities island-wide. Our mission is to contribute positively to national development by providing high quality potable water and sewage services to our residents and businesses in a cost-effective and sustainable manner. And our vision is by 2030 to ensure NWC is a well-resourced, responsive, customer-centric, efficient and compliant employer of choice, achieving 85% coverage 
with 80% for water and 30% for sewage. So NWC, in terms of water in Jamaica, it's, Jamaica is divided into 10 hydrological basins with most of our water being to the north. The north is where all the rain falls and the south, unfortunately, doesn't get as much. But most of our populations are located to the southern region of the island. From this graph, you can see where the white bar chart shows our exponential exploitable potential. And so there is water. Um, our motto is land of wood and water. So there is a lot of water in Jamaica, but what is exploitable is, um, is much less. So the majority of our population is located south. And so the demand in the south outweighs the exploitable po potential of the south. And over the next five years, it is projected that this demand on the south will outweigh what is exploitable and is of concern. Much of our exploitable water is not available due to allocation policies, as just about 8% of the total available resources is used by the NWC. But, and uh, sorry about that. This is due to more resources in the north section of the island and the greater demand in the south. Our cross-island transmission is extremely expensive, and as such, we have been using more of our groundwater. 75% of our available water is in the ground, and especially in the metropolitan area, the problem of our groundwater is that of contamination. We have nitrate contamination, as well as our wells are sometimes coastal wells, and so we have been impacted also by saline intrusion. The national production um, from this bar chart is showing that the demand is greater in the capital city of Kingston, where our demand is over 36 million imperial gallons per day. So while the usage is just about 38 million imperial gallons. But during our drought season, our um, deficit is over 17 million imperial gallons per day. And this is the general trend throughout the island where our southern parishes all have some sort of deficit between 20 to 40% during our dry seasons, which is just about twice per year, which we're actually experiencing just now. Um, usually it's between December to about April, and then our next dry period occurs during the summer months. Um, on the other hand, our northern parishes, these have an excess of water, which is just about 30%. So um, that's where our, our water really is, but the concern is most of our population is on the south. Our household access to pipe water, as you can see, is mostly situated in our, in our towns and cities, with most of our population in receiving water about 17 hours per day, and this coverage is approximately 75%. Most is concentrated in our major towns and cities, which is Kingston and Montego Bay, and of course our resort areas of the northern parishes of St. Anne, as well as St. Mary. Um, our sewage services are located only in 12 towns, 12 of our major towns and cities, and only covers about 30%. And so that is mostly in Kingston and our smaller towns of Spanish Town and um, in our resort area of Ocho Rios and Montego Bay, as well as Negril. Our water production facilities that we have is um, over 400 and our daily water production is 176 imperial gallons per day island wide. Our well sources are the most at 162, while our rivers are 116 and our springs, which produce the least, are 147. And so our network is just about 10,100 kilometers. Our pumping stations are over 200 and over 300 storage tanks. 
and our water treatment technology includes chlorination for our springs and wells and for our rivers. We conduct coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and chlorination for disinfection. In terms of our wastewater systems, we have over 67 and 95 pumping stations. Our um, facilities though are mostly older facilities which are about over 30 years old and as such are beyond their design capacities. As such, only about 38% of our facilities comply with the effluent standards. But over the last four years, the MWC has begun to rehabilitate some of these facilities with an aim to improve our wastewater treatment, as well as we are exploring the possibility of recycling some of our water for irrigation purposes. So our treatment technologies include aerated lagoon, wastewater stabilization ponds, oxidation ditch, tile fields, contact stabilization ponds, extended aeration, and septic tanks. Now our challenges. Um, and the sea is because we're located on a small state island, we are vulnerable to climate change and natural disasters. This has impacted our infrastructure, the water availability, as well as our human resources. We are susceptible to the effects of hurricanes and storms, earthquakes, sea level rise, and changes in our wet and dry season which have been affected also by El Nino and La Nina effects. And so this has also impacted our human resources where at times it's difficult to reach um, some of these areas during natural disasters. Vulnerability of our sources is also impacted by development and industrialization, especially as our country becomes more industrialized and modernized with um, a growing economy. This too influences the state of our aquifers. Our aquifers are prone to contamination since we are a limestone country. And so the effect of nitrates and phosphates as well as saline intrusion has been noticed, especially in our towns and cities where most of our population is located. We have also seen the impact of um, industrial and solid waste and the, on our domestic wastewater systems, where at times our um, BOD and COD has really been impacted. And this also impacts these aging wastewater facilities. Another challenge is our high non-revenue water where we have an age distribution system and this is impacting our, um, our infrastructure becoming leaky. And so we have been on a drive to replace a lot of our distribution network. And unfortunately, NWC is not a, does not receive subsidy from the government of Jamaica. And so NWC's recurring and non-recurring costs are financed through tariffs and loans. These sometimes are not enough to support all of our activities in order to achieve full cost recovery, but um, it, it works so far. Now, some of our initiatives that have been implemented includes the implementation of non-revenue activities across Jamaica, across all our parishes. We have begun on a drive to, to, um, to fix our distribution to include new infrastructure, as well as we've been partnering with a company outside of Israel in order to improve our non-revenue activities. And so this has seen an improvement in our Kingston area, which has seen a reduction of non-revenue water from 65% to just about 40%. So this has moved out to the rest of the island and it is hoped to bring our non-revenue water down to at least 40 to 30% over the next few years. And as we have review and implement measures to optimize the efficiency of key potable water systems. And so we are in looking to improve a lot of our older facilities. We have improved some of our larger facilities over the last five years. 
and are looking to do the same for at least 30 other critical facilities. We are looking to reduce energy by some 2% um, through the improvement of the type of equipment that we use, in, as well as implementing some renewable energy strategies. Also, we are looking to attain 1705, ISO 17025 accreditation for our quality assurance and meeting laboratories um, since our labs have been conducting much international water samples as well as our meters, which, um, which are governed by our Office of Utility Regulations. We require to have these labs being internationally certified. We are implementing an upgrade of our customer information system so as to ensure that our customers' needs are met as well as to improve our overall um, customer-centric activity. We are increasing sustained public awareness and our education programs, as well as stakeholder engagements. And we have started to include research and development activities in terms of water resource management. And this includes the use of stable isotopes in conjunction with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, where we have been exploring um, our aquifers using water-stable isotopes as well as um, N15, nitrogen 15, and looking at the age of these aquifers and seeing how much water is actually down there for us to use in the future, as well as to see what the properties of these waters are. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure some folks have questions if you're amenable to taking questions, just so sure. that we can get a deeper understanding. No problem. <clears throat> I would ask those of you who have questions, please to put them in the chat um, and we will be sure to read them uh, out loud so that everybody can can uh, understand the question. Uh, I will start with a question and I won't put it in the chat. Um, would you mind stopping to uh, stopping the share so we can uh, sure. can see you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. I changed my background to more tropical because I was just ah. really cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I don't I don't have one of those. That's all right. Um, I'm just wondering, you, you mentioned uh, climate change and, mm -hmm. and its impacts, and I'm just wondering how it has affected seasonality with respect to precipitation in Jamaica. I know it's increasing uh, hurricanes and, and the incidence of hurricanes, but I'm wondering if it's altering seasonality of rainfall and thus replenishment of the aquifers. Um, yes, it has, because normally we could set our clocks by when the rain is going to fall, that our rainy season is usually October every year and April every year, but this has not been so for the past two or three years. Um, the droughts are getting much longer, our rainy season is much shorter um, and unpredictable. Now, we are not sometimes so sure when it's going to give us rain. Um, usually, it's a long rainy season of October, November, almost into December. But um, as for instance, last year, it was just October. Um, so we are starting to see the effects of much shorter rainy seasons and much longer droughts. And so um, now we are seeing that the water levels are going down already. And usually wow. it's going to last us into the next rainy season. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, yeah. um, it's affecting lots. It, it's affecting us here too. It's altering mm -hmm. precipitation patterns in, in spring and some parts of Canada are experiencing quite profound drought. So, so we yeah. can, we can mm -hmm. certainly commiserate. Yeah. And it's not just Jamaica, it's the Caribbean. Um, all our Caribbean countries are, are experiencing this problem um, right. of the extended droughts. Um, because of that, the, the Metro, Meteorological Society has been doing more work to say how much rain we're going to get. And then it, the effect also of La Nina and El Nino is also not making it any better. This has been making it even worse to predict, to predict what exactly is going to happen in terms of our rainfall patterns. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you so much. There are some questions coming through in the chat, if you are amenable to uh, answering them. Sure. And I'll, I'll just read them in chronological order. So the first one is, um, and this is from Leslie, can mm -hmm. you please explain more what non-revenue water is? Do all water users pay for use? Okay, so non-revenue water is um, water that is not, um, not exactly paid for. So this is water before it reaches the customers. So this is the water that is um, that is at production stage as well as in our distribution pipes before it gets to the customer. So this isn't charged for it. This is our production water, our technical water. And then what is charged for, what the, comes after the customer gets it, that is the revenue water. And so this water, this loss is, um, is a loss for NWC, not for customers. Um, we're the ones who feel the pain of non-revenue water really. Um, all water users pay for use. Uh, if they are piped and if they're on our system, so we, we, we are not the only water provider for Jamaica, but we're the largest. So if customers are on our system, then yes, they pay for the use of the water. But if they're on another system or have their own system, then they, um, they deal with that person, that private entity, or the parish council or the government. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Our, our next question is with, uh, from Stephen, spelled correctly with a PH. Um, <laughs> for future resources, is there more emphasis on conservation to use less water in Jamaica or on wastewater treatment for re reuse of the water? At the moment, the emphasis is on conservation of water, but um, it is hoped that we will get into the reuse of wastewater eventually, but it's to get the buy-in from the public. Um, I know worldwide, it is difficult to get the public to buy into the idea of reusing wastewater. Um, so now we focus mostly on water conservation activities. Um, we, we do a lot of PR in terms of that every, every year, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, a number of questions here, and as long as you're not tired of them, I will continue. <laughs> um, this no is problem. wonderful, it's very educational. Um, the next question is from Fidelis, first name. Uh, how is it possible for phosphate to contaminate the aquifer like nitrate? Well, unfortunately, um, not everywhere is sewered for us. And so a lot of persons have soak away pits and that kind of thing. And then the problem of our fertilizers or, um, or waste from households ends up end, ending up into our aquifers, unfortunately. Phosphate isn't as much a problem as the nitrate. The nitrate is the one that we're mostly worried about. Um, but there are some areas that have some phosphate, but it's not as bad. Um, it's not as much a worry for us. I like the, the nitrate. The nitrate is really where our biggest worry is, especially in our city centers um, where the nitrate levels can be pretty high above the standard. And so we have to abandon quite a few of our wells because of this. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. This next point and uh, question is from my co-host, Dwight. Um, the rainy season seem to be shorter, but more intense. How do these more intense periods of rainfall impact the activities of the NWC? Well, unfortunately, um, yes, we love the rain, but when it's that fast and that intense, the problem is um, turbidity. Our turbidity levels and our debris that comes down, we are unable to still capture much of that water. We still have to send so much to waste, even though it's so much water, but it's beyond the level of our, our facilities to treat, unfortunately. And so it has to go to waste some of the time, unfortunately. It is what it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question from Kwame. Uh, does the NWC have to manage any issues with respect to microplastics, for example, in wastewater or river resources? Unfortunately, we haven't been checking for microplastics, so I, it's difficult to say. Um, it would be interesting to start some sort of partnership to see what our microplastic level is like, but we, we generally really don't know. Um, what's the levels, what is there? We really don't know. We haven't explored that. that. Okay. 
Well, I can say that we do have some folks at uh, Queens who do study microplastics, mm -hmm. including in the Department Interesting. of Health. So, our potential partnership. Nice yeah, we can. It's a potential potential yeah. partnership. Yes. Wonderful. Um, the next is uh, from Mona. Uh, no mention was made of catchment systems, reservoirs, and dams. Jamaica seems to be getting short periods of intense rainfall, as was already mentioned, part of the climate-induced change in pattern. Are there plans to increase catchment? Um, at this time, no. There isn't plans as yet to increase catchment, but what is um, what we're looking at is, is more groundwater as well as getting water from outside of Kingston. Um, to put in catchment in Kingston now is difficult because of where our population is. It's so tightly populated. Where would we put this catchment? But, um, and, and unfortunately, most of our population does come to Kingston. And so we need more water always in Kingston. So what we're looking at is really the groundwater because most of the water is actually there. But as I said, the problem of the contamination of nitrates is, is where we're looking into how can we get rid of this issue as well. And so to circumvent the supply of water, as well as carrying in water from St. Catherine, our neighboring parish, that is the, the other alternative that we're looking at and um and as well as St. Thomas to see what is possible yeah okay thank you uh just for our, our Canadian attendees how big is Kingston the city of Kingston your largest city um Kingston oh, just, a, just a guess I, <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> I didn't mean to miles. <laughs> <laughs> my geography is so poor <laughs> I don't know maybe hmm, I don't know I don't is want it to a third, third the country, perhaps? Um, not even a third, no. Kingston is one of the smallest parishes, actually. Okay. Um, yes, it's actually the smallest. So the, that's the unfortunate thing, is that Kingston is so tiny mm -hmm. in comparison to the rest of the island. Um, maybe, I don't know, I'll have to, I'll have to check. Okay. <laughs> Less than 500 <laughs> kilometers square. There you go, 480. Somebody did put it in the chat. No, I, I actually meant, and I misspoke. I didn't state my question. I meant how many human inhabitants, how many- Oh, how population? many persons, ah, population-wise, ah. I see. It's um, maybe between 500, 750 okay. people. Yeah. So quite a substantial size. <laughs> yeah, Kingston is a lot. Kingston is a majority of the population is in Kingston and St. Catherine. Thank you so much. And, and forgive me for uh, <laughs> not asking the question clearly. Um, so the next question is from Williams. We will let you off the hook soon, but I, I <laughs> it, this is okay. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, from Williams, is there a rural mm -hmm. urban gap in access to potable water in Jamaica? If yes, what measures are being put in place by NWC to bridge this rural urban gap? Um, yes, there is a gap in terms of our rural areas. Um, the, the cities, as we've said, are the towns, is where it's generally pipe, having piped water. But there is access to potable water in terms of parish councils. So in terms of the government, more than the NWC, that the, uh, the government has put in place for the parish council to supply them with water more than the National Water Commission, because um, we, are, we are an entity that still has to make our own money. And so it has to be viable for us, not just um, the customers, in order to put in these, these facilities, especially in deep rural areas. And so that's where the government comes in. They, they are the ones who supply a lot of these deep, deep rural areas. In terms of what measures are in place to bridge the gap, um, some areas I know it's difficult for us to go in. Um, the deep rural areas, it's not so easy, but there are measures in place of some of the less rural areas that we've, over the next five to 10 years that we're thinking of widening our coverage another five to 10%. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, there are a number of estimates of the size of the- I know. <laughs> coming in on the chat and so on. Yes. Um, so the next question again is from Kwame. Uh, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on, uh, uh, glyphosate contamination of water sources in Jamaica. Glycophosphate. Mm, is it glycophosphate? I'm not too sure. Um, maybe Kwame can explain a little better for me, please. 
<laughs> but he can, uh, add, he can add some more detail in this. Yes, yeah, some more detail, please. Yeah. Um, uh, this is from Dwight again. Is there any mm -hmm. collaboration between the NWC and the National Irrigation Commission? There is some collaborations um, in terms of um, the canal and what that water is used for in St. Catherine, which is our neighboring parish, and in terms of the water from Rio Cobre, because um, Rio Cobre is also used for irrigation, not just for potable water. And so we, we have had dialogue in terms of how much we get, how much they get, and we have to purchase water from them as well. Um, also for some of the wells in Clarendon and St. Catherine, it's, um, we have to have collaboration with them. Also in St. Catherine, because um, there was the issue of the Rio Cobra aquifer being over abstracted, we had put in place uh, um, artificial recharge. And so water is taken from the Rio Cobra in conjunction with NIC to go back down into the aquifer. So we're doing studies to see if this is actually working to push back the saline front and um, to increase the amount of water in that aquifer. So yeah. So glyphosate is just a major component of uh, Roundup pest. Oh, oh, okay, got it. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know just how much is there. Um, NWC doesn't do much in terms of pesticide testing in-house as we don't have the equipment, but I believe the pesticide laboratory up there by UE would be better able to tell us how much is really out there. Um, it is a worry that we have um, of pesticide contamination, but um, we, we work in conjunction with UE on that one. We really do. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. I think you've been wonderfully generous with your time and perhaps <laughs> we should let you off the hook now. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, but sure. uh, I, I would ask that all of the attendees virtually uh, join me in thanking um, uh, Mrs. Harrison Smith for giving us wonderful insight into the National Water Commission. So thank no you so much. This, You're this welcome. Where, this is where we do the applause like that. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, might I suggest if you all have been up since four like me and drinking tea and coffee that we take a, a short five minute break. And if our next plenary speaker is amenable, we can start uh, 10 minutes early at 10.05. So why don't we just take a, a brief break, if that's okay. Hey, Stephen. Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm here. Just wanted to check in with you. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, uh, you've been made co-host, so you should be able to share your screen at any time. You know, this will be the first time that I've uh, shared my screen uh, using Zoom. So you just hit the green and then... Yeah. You just make sure that all your mortgage payments and everything oh, else yeah. that are all lying around on your desktop are not obvious. Okay. I've been caught a few times out with my chats being shown <laughs> to, to people. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you just hit the green share and it, it should come it up here. the screen then, right? So. Yeah, so just at the bottom, you're probably well, using a PC. This up now. Uh, you go ahead if you want to. Uh, just let me see if I can pop this up and see how that works. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so there's two options. There's the that one. You are sharing your screen now, so okay. I'll put it in presentation mode. How's that working? Uh, just throw it into presentation mode now, and let's have a look. Yeah. Well, I I, I did. I didn't. Uh, it did it not come up into presentation mode. No, I can still see your panel of slides along the left. I mean, it works fine. Um, yeah, but, um, let's just see if I can't. Uh, so I share. Okay, it's, it's, it's probably it's in the other monitor. Let me share. How about that? Is that working now? No, I still see. You know how there's the the thumbnails along the left hand side. Yeah. Let me just try that. It's probably because uh, I've got it set up with um, it's two screens come up on monitor. Right. I'll, I'll just change the, uh, I'll stop the share. Okay. Let's try 
try that again. That's it. Got it? Yep. Right. Okay. Sounds like we're we're good to go then. I'll just leave it up if that's okay. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I will just make use of the facilities and be right back. So Jeff, if you're ready, I'll uh, briefly introduce you. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, but given that we don't have simultaneous sessions, uh, concurrent sessions, I don't think it's an issue. Yeah, no, you can, that's what's nice about the planner. <laughs> So our second plenary speaker is Dr. Jeff Rodell. Uh, Jeff received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Trent University um, and his master's degree in chemistry from the University of Ottawa. He received his PhD in oceanography from Dalhousie University, which for our Jamaican attendees is on the east coast of Canada in the lovely city of Halifax, Nova Scotia. He undertook postdoctoral fellowships at the National Water Research Institute of Canada and the University of Montreal in freshwater biology. He joined the St. Lawrence River Institute, which is based in Cornwall, just to our east in the province of Ontario, in 1995 as its first research scientist. Jeff became executive director of the River Institute in 2004, a position he has held ever since. He holds adjunct professorships with Queen's University and the University of Ottawa. Jeff is Canadian co-chair of the Science Priority Committee for the International Joint Commission of the United States and Canada, um, which is responsible for um, St. Lawrence setting priorities and such. Today, Jeff will speak on Great Lakes, Great River, natural history, current challenges and restoration in the St. Lawrence River Basin. So thank you very much, Jeff. Take it away. Thank you, Steve. How's my volume? It's it's perfect. Okay, great. And uh, okay, so um, I appreciate uh, Steve that introduction, and uh, thank you very much for the inviting me to um, give a plenary talk at this inaugural Pulpert Water Symposium. I'll start uh, by acknowledging uh, the traditional territories, and that I am uh, east of Kingston. So I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands that are the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee. We're grateful for the opportunity to live where we do, and we thank all generations of people who have continued the responsibilities to Mother Earth since time immemorial. Uh, so today, uh, 
with the plenary um, invite, um, I thought what I would do essentially for, uh, particularly for the those people from Jamaica is to give a chance to give an overview of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River system, uh, talk a little bit about its natural history, some of the major issues and challenges and concerns in the, uh, in the basin. Uh, and then speak to you a little bit about the work that the River Institute is doing with respect to uh, the organization that I work for and with respect to restoration and progress as well as some of the research and then ultimately uh, how we tie that into outreach and engagement with the public. And so as you can see, there's a nice global map in the location of the St. Lawrence River and I'll give you a little bit more detail about that. So let's just start kind of at the beginning. Um, some 20,000 years ago, this is what the, uh, the, the system looked like. Uh, it, it was covered with many, many meters of uh, glacial ice. And, uh, and gradually as that ice receded, what uh, happened when it left in depressions caused by those glaciers were many large water bodies, including the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River system. So the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes are very young compared to many other water bodies and other river systems around the world. So only 8,000 years old versus, you know, other rivers uh, such as the Mississippi, the, the Nile, Amazon, and others that are millions of years old. So a relatively new feature on this planet, which is amazing. And 8,000 years in geological time frame is a blink of an eye. Um, so this is the system that we uh, have a responsibility to and are working with in, in the St. Lawrence Great Lakes. So it's a huge area, almost 250,000 uh, square kilometers with a watershed that's quite that size, uh, twice that size. And it contains 20% of the world's surface freshwater supply. So uh, just an incredible resource um, that we share amongst the peoples of Canada, U.S., and uh, the, the Indigenous peoples of, uh, um, that have had um, <clears throat> a long uh, traditional standing within the Great Lakes system. Uh, there's a coastline of some 25,000 kilometers and a population of almost 50 million people that live in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River. Here's a little more of a, a closer in in the area that we are um, we're working with and where it involves both the the Queens and, and, and the River Institute. Um, so you have the, the end of the Great Lakes system here at the Lake Ontario, which is the headwaters for the St. Lawrence River, which flows from west to east into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this, so here we are here at Kingston, uh, where Queens University is located. And just as about 200 kilometers east of that is the city of Cornwall, uh, where the River Institute is located. That section of the river is often referred to as the Upper St. Lawrence River or the International section because it's actually that section of the river where um, it's shared between the U.S. and Canada. And thereafter, after, after Cornwall, the, the river essentially flows and is, is within the, the, the country of Canada and the province of Ontario and Quebec. It's the 16th largest river globally by discharge and it's also the entrance to the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway which is a project that was built um, that resulted in major alterations to the waterway and allowed ocean going ships uh, to enter to into the Great Lakes and make their way through a series of canal systems uh, and dams make its way all the way up to the headwaters in Lake Superior here in terms of those growing ships. So obviously there were some major alterations and as well as brought about a number of impacts uh, um, uh, due to that, um, the intrusion of these large ocean going ships into the Great Lakes system. So this area has had multiple stressors in environmental degradation. Uh, it's, you know, a huge area, highly industrialized, um, a long history of industrialization, urbanization, as well as agricultural um, impacts and habitat changes. And, and so just to hit some of the, the major ones, that includes loss of biodiversity, 
uh, through habitat changes in invasive species, excess nutrients in algal blooms, uh, in intrusion and inputs of toxic chemicals and accumulation of those toxic chemicals into wildlife. And uh, currently, uh, climate change is another major impact. And I'll just touch on some of those to give you a little bit more of an understanding of what, what, I'm, what, what these mean. So here's, the, here's that starting point for me in terms of here at Cornwall is the construction of the St. Lawrence uh, River dam, the Moses Saunders dam in the 1950s. And you can just see that this whole river was uh, under this major project. It was certainly one considered one of the most important engineering and, and impressive engineering projects at the time. Um, and, um, and so it resulted in a construction of a number of dams and control systems. You can see here, again, we're on the upper San Lawrence River and two major dams uh, um, hydroelectric dams have, were created. Um, the Moses Saunders Dam, which is located at Cornwall, here, number three, and then the Bohanoi Dam that is in the province of Quebec. Um, and so, yes, there are obviously benefits in terms of water control, hydroelectric uh, production, shipping, but of course, from an ecological point of view, a number of significant impacts, including biodiversity loss from changing the, the natural flows of the river, and as well as ha ha uh, habitat fragmentation, fragmentation from uh, migrating uh, for migrating fish. So the habitat fragmentation is certainly a major physical impairment within the St. Lawrence River system, and and uh, you know this certainly the dams remove access to traditional spawning beds and increase the mortality for any fish that needs to pass through the dams. And the, the, the classic example of a fish that's been highly impacted as a result of this is the American eel, one of the most traditionally, one of the most important uh, fishes in the St. Lawrence and, uh, and Lake Ontario system. And what you have see here are some charts that show that the precipitous decline of the eel populations uh, at, through uh, counts there are eel ladders, so they did install ladders to allow for upstream migration of, uh, of young eels, juvenile eels, up into the system. You can see here, this is the, the life cycle of the American eel, which is just remarkable. It's a remarkable species. In fact, many people, even at Queen's University, have studied this, uh, um, this, this organism. It, it spawns in the Sargasso Sea near our, our, our um, our colleagues that in, 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 the, in the West Indies and makes its way as to, uh, um, gradually through its growth cycles into uh, the streams and rivers on the American coast, including the St. Lawrence River uh, and makes its way into St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario where it matures and then having reached maturity and sexual maturity, it starts its journey back to the Sargasso to spawn, but of course, passing through turbines, there's no ladders to, to, to allow the eels to return. They must pass through the turbines and there is, um, research has shown that 20% mortality of those, re of those returning eels as it passes through each of the two dams. So 40% mortality overall is never a positive thing for any population and, and accounts for some of these uh, dips and these declines to near, you know, very low levels. There are other causes that have been investigated, including uh, toxic substances, cl uh, climate change, and, and other factors. But certainly, we know that this has had an imp important uh, impact on the American eel. The other aspect is a little more insidious. It's the uh, stabilization of water levels from natural flows. And so what this graph shows here is the um, water level record uh, pre-dam and post-dam. And what you can see is how the water levels have been stabilized since the dam is in place. And, um, you know, there's positive impacts for those people, uh, uh, for riparian uh, uh, residents and other factors, but ecologically, this is not a positive thing as um, it allows for intrusion of and stabilization in areas where the traditionally uh, the habitats of natural flora Gradients would be in place, but what we have now, specifically in the Lake Ontario and St. Lawrence River, are stabilized, uh, are cattail marshes that have come in under these stabilized water um, regimes. And this has choked up uh, 
habitats for um, that would have been used for fish spawning and nursery. Uh, and um, species, native species like the northern pike have really been impacted in terms of their populations by these very dense cattail marshes. So this is a, another impact uh, as a result of this work. Allowing um, ocean going ships and other intrusions into the St. Lawrence River Great Lakes has resulted in the introduction of invasive species uh, and these invasive species obviously have an impact on native uh, species and uh, by either through predation or through just by, um, you know, competition trophically. Uh, the classic and early examples in the 19, early 1900s were the sea lamprey, which uh, attached themselves to large fish, large native fish, and essentially consumed and uh, consumed the blood of the, those fish to the point where they eventually die. Um, and so this has had impact on large um, sports fish and large, larger fish in this uh, Great Lakes. Uh, and there are active control programs to try to control the populations of sea lamprey. Another major impact came about with the introduction of the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels, which uh, 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 made significant changes uh, to the trophic structure in, in the Great Lakes, particularly as a result of uh, um, through the uh, their incredible filter feeder, feeders and, and changed uh, dramatically the algal um, density in the Great Lakes and created something that's known as the near shore shunt by actually as they their vast densities removed a lot of the, the uh, algae and essentially the associated nutrients and energy associated with that and prevented, prevented that energy from making its way out into the open waters of the Great Lakes and, and, and um, focused that um, in, in the near shore areas and created uh, a series of impacts, uh, including changing the trophic stru structure in, in these areas and resulted in some nutrient problems, which I'll talk about later. Um, more recently, the round goby has uh, come in to the Great Lakes and now represents a, a significant fraction of the biomass and that another aggressive um, um, organism, multi uh, spawns several times a year, so very productive. Um, and has pushed out um, native species that uh, from habitats, especially in the benthic areas, near shore benthic areas. So, and there are other species shown here. Uh, one of the threats that's not here yet are Asian carp that are in the Mississippi system. And there are a canal in Lake Michigan that would uh, potentially provide an opportunity for these Asian carp to enter the Great Lakes. And uh, so this is a, a huge fear. These are very, again, would represent a huge impact in the Great Lakes system if they were here. If they arrived, there is currently an electrical fence in this canal system that is uh, being used to prevent uh, these uh, Asian carps from entering uh, entering into the uh, Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes system and, and, you know, with, and a lot of attention being paid to ensuring that these, uh, these Asian carp do not make it into the system because they would represent a pretty uh, significant stress on the entire system. Another major issue that uh, has received quite a bit of attention is uh, eutrophication in undesirable algae. And in fact, uh, it's really kind of one of the first issues that uh, brought about the attention of the, the governments in the 60s and 70s. And so uh, um, nutrient controls were put in place, uh, water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants were built uh, with the idea of reducing nutrients. And in terms of the 70s and 80s, there were significant improvements from nutrient controls. Um, these controls were put in place through something called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And that was a partnership between the US and Canada um, to reduce these nutrients inputs. However, with the result of the changes that we saw in the 1990s, including the, the, this, the zebra mussels that I referred to in terms of creating this new dynamic in terms of energy flow and, and creating a concentration of nutrients in the near shore areas of the Great Lakes, especially Lake Ontario, we saw the return of nuisance algae like Lodophora 
uh, to the Great Lakes and increase cyanobacteria blooms. So this has now been an, an, uh, an, another focused area for current research and current programs, government programs to reduce uh, nutrients even further and ongoing research to identify, you know, what is the right level, what is the right loading of nutrients into the lakes that will prevent these blooms. Uh, there are, turns out that there's also resulting, some of these blooms are resulting from cumulative stressors, including things like changing agricultural practices, again, the zebra mussels I mentioned, and include increased runoff from climate change. Um, and so there, this is an active area of research, this concept of cum cumulative stressors. <clears throat> the other uh, important area for research and for understanding you know, the impacts to the Great Lakes are the inflow of toxic substances as a result of the industrialization and agricultural practices from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and uh, this resulted in what we now call legacy chemicals being uh, in, in put into the lakes. And fortunately, those chemicals are declining. Those are thing, we're talking about chemicals less, such as PCBs, dioxins and furans, organochlorine pesticides, PAHs, and mercury. The ones shown in, in, in yellow here are ones that are currently responsible for fish consumption restrictions. And so are, even though their, their levels have declined through the processes of bioaccumulation, uh, we still have widespread fish consumption restrictions in Lake Ontario and St. Lawrence River, and in fact, all of the Great Lakes, but they're particularly uh, critical in Lake Ontario and St. Lawrence River. So we see direct effects such as uh, fish tumors and crossbill um, bills in, in, in uh, waterfowl declining, so which is good news, but these uh, more subtle effects, more lingering effects still remain. And we're also uh, quite a deal, um, quite a bit of research is being done on new chemicals of concern that are emerging from computer, uh, consumer based urban sources, including flame retardants, fluorinated substances, pharmaceuticals, microplastics, just to name a few. Climate change impacts, of course, are being felt in the Great Lakes. Uh, and one of the most direct um, evidence of, of this is, some, uh, is flooding that's happened recently in Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River system, uh, resulting from a numerous kind of interactions between different stressors, that including wet springtime uh, weather. So we have our traditional um, wintertime creates a, a great deal of snow on the ground, and then we have what, uh, a melt. And in, in this, at this point in time, during this period, there can be a large accumulation of, uh, of water in the Great Lakes system. And together with other factors, things like, uh, uh, in this case, it, it was a, a combination of factors, high average inflows, so large uh, levels accumulating in Lake Erie, high inflows into the Ottawa River system. So there's a necessary to kind of, um, to, to, to help try to find a way to best manage all of this water. And, and in fact, it even goes back to the unusual ice formation in the St. Lawrence River during the winter time, which prevented the ability of the, um, of, of the governments to manage the system and remove water at the levels that they wanted to uh, without the, the, the ice formation that would normally occur. So we have seen some pretty significant flooding in the Great Lakes system in the Lake Ontario and St. Lawrence River over the past years, uh, direct impacts of climate change. All of these and climate change acts as one of these multiple stressor. So it works in conjunction with other uh, toxic chemicals, multi, uh, um, excess nutrients and uh, other factors to create essentially a cumulative stress. So here is a graphic that's produced, uh, was produced by Dave Allen and others uh, with the, um, uh, the GLEAM project that shows a, a kind of a gradient of cumulative stress in the Great Lakes and, and where you have populations, where you have impacts, where you have agriculture, uh, you see the stressors increase. And as it goes, basically increasing from west, east, so that in the Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River system, we see some of the most, uh, the highest scoring for cumulative stress in the entire Great Lakes system. And a call from Dave, um, uh, Sterner 
to say there's an urgent need to understand whether the ecosystem response to multiple stressors is simply additive or involves synergistic or antagonistic effects. And I know there are some students that I'm aware of at Queen's University, they're actually looking at the, this uh, question right here. And so I believe that they are presenting um, later on in the symposium. So I think things would be much worse uh, since this is a shared system between the Canada and the US that there wasn't uh, an important partnership that exists that I'll speak to. And that is that it was, you know, almost incredible that in fact, that with some foresight that the governments of Canada and the US came together under something called the Boundary, Water, Boundary Waters Treaty back in 1909 to recognize that the two partners that Canada and the US have to negotiate and they have to work together to help protect this Great Lakes system. And it was initially designed as in terms of having a regulatory role, role with respect to water levels and flow, uh, flows uh, and water quantity. But in 1972, as, res, uh, as a result of um, increasing concerns and increasing recognition that water, water quality was an important aspect that um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was signed in 1972. And it's been amended um, as more issues and other issues are recognized. It's gone through a series of amendments and the latest one is in 2012. And as was said at the top, I've been fortunate enough to be part of this um, system. Um, there are advisory groups that advise the commissioners and um, one of which is the Science Priority Committee, uh, part of the Science Advisory Board. And I've been the Canadian co-chair for the last um, uh, six years with the, uh, the Science Priority Committee. So it's been a very interesting and, and uh, um, uh, great opportunity to be involved in this system. One of the biggest programs that was put in place uh, through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was the Great Lakes Area of Concern Program, uh, which was um, the many different aspects to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. But this one was meant to really focus in, uh, in those areas that were most affected um, um, by heavy industry, by a cluster of heavy industry or, or other impacts um, that um, to, to try to make uh, differences in these specific geographic areas. So you see there were 43 Great Lakes area of concern on both sides of Canada and US. A number of them were binational, one of which was the St. Lawrence River here at the far part of the system uh, centered at, at Cornwall Messina. Uh, where I'm speaking to you from today. So here you have is a more of a detailed graphic. So this is about a 50 kilometer stretch of the river. Actually, the Moses Saunders Dam that I mentioned earlier is just on the western border of this uh, system. And it opens up into an, a lake-like uh, uh, part of the, the river called the Pluvio Lake. And that's about a 50 kilometer stretch of the river uh, up uh, an important, important area, um, uh, concentration of, um, of um, sport fishing and, and uh, other activities. And most importantly, uh, was the traditional territories of the Mohawks of Aquasasne. So here you have this, it's a really interesting system. Uh, jurisdictionally, you through, um, there is that uh, uh, international border that runs right through this territory of Aquasasne. So you actually have a US population and a Canadian population. Uh, um, but however, the citizens of Aquasasne see themselves essentially whole as whole as the peoples of Aquasasne and, and don't um, don't really see these borders in the same way that we do. And so they um, they are caught in the middle of this area of concern uh, because uh, due to the formation of the dam, the cheap hydroelectric power and just the kind of the traditional uh, importance of this area, major industries uh, existed in the 1900s, uh, both on the, on the Canadian side and the American side with their own individual impacts. And so this area of concern was identified and um, in a, um, something called a remedial action plan was established. And in this process, this led to the formation of the organization that I work for, the River Institute, as a nonprofit organization that was dedicated to research on the river, 
to protect the biodiversity and ecological function and to support these restoration programs. We also work to broaden education outreach activities and grow partnerships locally and globally with a view to create and maintain healthy and sustainable river ecosystems. So we have been involved quite a bit with this area of concern and the remedial, remedial action uh, plan program. The goal of the program is just to improve conditions within the ecosystem that are heavily degra degraded to those that are equivalent to the non-degraded areas in the Great Lakes and through a multi-phase process. Uh, essentially, it's, it's identifying the key concerns, developing restoration activities to, uh, to achieve delisting targets, to achieve the improvement um, that is desired, and then to report out through a consultation process uh, with all of the partners uh, on the, the improvement in the system and to document that and then to, um, you know, with the, with the agreement and through this collaboration to essentially delist the area of concern. That's a long-term goal. So what meant was a lot of uh, projects on the ground called remedial action plan projects brought about through government and community partnerships. Um, and some examples included larger industrial and municipal projects to uh, improve standards and improve treatment processes and track sources and, and, and mitigate those sources. Uh, agricultural projects, because in fact, uh, uh, a large uh, part of this watershed is, is heavily agricultural. So there needed to be improvements to the habitats, to the agri agricultural practices and containing you know, agricultural um, discharges and working with local landowners through uh, with government programs to in, improve the habitat and to ensure that runoff was minimized or is minimized. One of the areas that the River Institute has been most active on is research on mercury, which was uh, there was a source in Cornwall, uh, a chloroalkali plant that discharged tons of mercury over a course of 100 years into the system. And you can see the sort of uh, some of the, the um, in the early years it's shown in the red here are the um, very uh, higher concentrations of mercury, particularly along the North Shore, because the hydraulics of the river kind of contains as it flows from uh, west to east, kind of contains those inputs along the North Shore of the river. Um, this is for mercury. And so what we needed to understand were the inputs, the processes that were involved, um, the processes of food chain transfer and to create models and undertake detailed monitoring and mapping to, 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 to be able to document the recovery processes. And you can see through this series of maps that uh, stretch to from uh, 1979 to 2008, that gradually the system is recovering primarily as a process that as uh, sources in the Great Lakes, sources that in Cornwall and upstream, where mercury was formerly used, have been um, essentially those taps have been turned off, and now we have cleaner sediments that are uh, overlying the, um, the the formerly um, contaminated sediments in the system, essentially through a kind of a natural re reformation. But understanding the impacts and 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 those areas are most impacted is part of this research. And it's been uh, one of the successes and probably the in initial partnership that we established with Queen's University, Ottawa University, and other partners. As part of this overall program is the involvement of community. So there was a, uh, a community-led uh, group uh, called the Great River Network that has worked in partnership with all of our agencies to undertake uh, very visible projects and to empower uh, the community in part of this cleanup process. Uh, you can see here it's actually a, a diver led and a shoreline uh, led program to actually remove debris from the river and it's a very visible um, progress, visible, very visible action that everyone can be proud of. Um, so this is part of this programming. And what we've seen now over the years is some gradual ecosystem recovery, for example, the return of the osprey, which were, uh, were had, had been excavated from the area and now returned and are successfully reproducing. And this is a major accomplishment. We've also seen water quality improvements 
over the years in terms of and the return of, of um, um, being able to open beaches and uh, return to some of the activities that had previously been uh, denied to the local area. So here's just a little, uh, these icons represent different uh, issues and of the initial ones, you see a number of them are have moved into a green status, not some other are, um, are, are getting close. And then there are some ones that are stubborn and, uh, and are, are taking a, a number of time, including in red here, fish consumption restrictions, um, undesirable algae, fish and wildlife populations. And, uh, and the beach one is one we're just actually going to be changing over into a green in the next, uh, uh, through a, um, a process that should happen over the next year. So that's a, a good one. And um, so the, and the habitats according, uh, obviously difficult um, as we look to improve uh, fish and wildlife life habitat, and which is a slow process working with local landowners and local, um, essentially local partners. Just to touch on some of the other research that we're undertaking at the River Institute, one of the key programs we have is the FINS project, and it's uh, led by one of our scientists, a man, um, Matt Windle, who is undertaking a large scale a sort of ecosystem health research program to investigate fish communities, aquatic habitats, uh, and relate water quality levels and water quality and water level um, changes to, to these ecosystem um, characteristics. We're also looking at things, species at risk in the system and aquatic invasive species. This, uh, one of the key features of this program is that we're working in collaboration with the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne and with the community of Aquasasne. You see a number of people from Aquasasne actually participate in this research program. It focuses on this upper St. Lawrence River system and uh, and it's actually over the last five years has a, a, a has undertaken and, and accumulated a, a large number of samples over 130,000 fish have been sampled in the St. Lawrence system here as a result of this program uh, it's one of the most important fish databases now that that we have on the system uh, with numerous sites uh, between Kingston Cornwall and into past Montreal And it wanted to talk about this because it was it's formed the basis for a partnership that we have with Queens and actually that uh, our host Steve Lahey uh, is the PI on uh, together with other professors at Queens. Uh, and it's uh, developing a new real time community based environmental DNA protocols for assessing freshwater ecosystems. So we're hoping to work with the our partners at Aquasasti River Institute and also the Mohawk community at, in the Bay of Quinte to develop these uh, techniques to assess the, um, the, the, the ecosystem and be able to transfer those protocols to communities. And so we're very excited about that project. This FINS project also uses unmanned aerial vehicles um, and is as, as, as a tool for mapping habitats and for looking at the impacts of water level fluctuations on sensitive species. So this has become another major focus of our work is using these tools. And this is just a simple um, commercial drone shown here, uh, but they can provide very important information for assessing habitats and for assessing ecosystems. This project is, is a real important data set source for another project that we're uh, actively involved in called the Great River Report, an ecosystem health report on the Upper St. Lawrence River. So this is led by one of our, another one of our scientists, Dr. Lee Magahi, and again is a partnership with the Mohawks of Aquasasne. In fact, it's inspired, the, the, the approach that's taken is being inspired what, what's called the Thanksgiving Address, which is how uh, it, the, the Mohawks and other Indigenous peoples acknowledge the uh, importance of the natural uh, environment and the components of the natural environment with respect to their overall existence. And so by using that and as suggested by our Mohawk partners, 
we're using it to frame our ecosystem. So I think this is the first time that approach has been used and we're very excited and Dr. Lee is uh, doing a phenomenal job in involving multiple stakeholders and multiple partners to identify ecosystem health indicators, tell important stories around the people that are involved in the ecosystem and how they interact with the ecosystem. And we hope that this will help fill data gaps, but also identify areas for future uh, research. So in, in summary, um, taking it from the large description of the Great Lakes system and then to the work of the River Institute, we really believe that you need to have a combination of the research and uh, activities as we do at universities and at research centers, but you have to work with community and education and, and, and in outreach to help um, make that uh, research really valuable um, for protecting the ecosystem. Um, at the River Institute, we, we feel that we need to share knowledge for future generations and we need to actively mentor uh, um, young scientists in, in terms of helping to uh, create the next generation of researchers. We're active in uh, schools with school uh, age children through hands-on learning programs. In fact, we have over uh, 7,500 students typically per year that we uh, deliver programs to. Um, certainly COVID uh, as, everyone, as, as it has for everything has impacted uh, um, these ability to deliver such programs. So we've taken a lot of these programs online and learning how to deliver um, um, these uh, interesting programs to a wide variety of students. Another aspect is our broader community outreach. So not to within school systems, but into the broader community. One of which is our science and nature speaker series, which is now online. It can be um, viewed anywhere by anyone anywhere um, uh, monthly. And that's a speaker system, a speaker series to help bring science to community. And then lastly, similar to, to what's happening today through this Fulford Symposium, we have our own annual symposium, River Symposium, um, that been, we've been hosting for now 27 years. Uh, and the most recent version was held this past October. Uh, we, we held it again online, just as this one is done. And in fact, you can still go to the, uh, to the website here and see some of the recorded sessions, including a phenomenal talk that was given as a plenary talk by Abraham Francis, who is the environmental director at the Mohawks of Aquasasne. So I would definitely suggest you check that out. So we believe in a sort of an inclusive and adaptive governance model for the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River system in which you work with communities, research is important, but you share that knowledge and by understanding and sometimes the communities tell you the research that is needed. And so by working in in partnership with communities uh, and, and in informing actions and informing decision making, we can work towards creating a healthy river um, system and a healthy Great Lakes. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. <clears throat> I've, I've moved to a, a lunar background, so just switching it up a bit for myself. Um, you would be you be amenable to uh, having some questions asked of, of your presentation? Certainly. So I would ask again, any of our attendees to uh, um, put questions into the chat and, and I will ask them. Um, maybe I could start. I, I know in the Western United States that there is a movement towards blowing up dams. Now I realized at Cornwall, they're not going to blow up that big one, but I'm wondering all, uh, about in Eastern Ontario and Western Quebec, whether there's a movement on some of the smaller tributaries to get rid of these damming structures that do influence runoff and things like that. Yeah. So, and there are thousands of dams in the, in, in the Great Lakes system. And, uh, um, the, the ones, the, the focus areas that I've seen is specifically smaller dam structures, and there was one uh, locally in uh, the St. Regis River that has happened, that where you can show that by removing that dam, 
that you increase uh, the uh, access to habitat. So probably the most successful program is 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 been through in the in the U.S. Uh, along the southern shore of the, uh, Lake Ontario, where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has an actual program dedicated to identifying those low low rise dams and and in improving conduct, uh, connectivity. And there has been a number of su uh, successful projects there. Um, I, I can't think of too many uh, examples, though, in Canada where we have um, have done, and if others who are in the audience are aware of them. Um, but um, it, it is something that I believe is, is highly needed and can be done successfully. Um, and uh, much of the dams, obviously, uh, Ontario Power Generation is um, looking to uh, assessing where they could do that. There's a lot of potential impacts, of course, uh, well, over in terms of when you remove the dam, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a simple thing. You've got to ensure that restoration is done and that you didn't, uh, in fact, make the system worse than it was before. So I think there, that there is some interest in it, but the, it, I, I'm not aware of too many examples in Canada, in Eastern Ontario, where that has occurred. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to the chat here. We have a number of questions. This is from Fidelis. Canada and US share the management of the water um, presented here. Is there any stipulated agreement specific to this water management or management governed by their country of rule, I guess, is talking about uh, the United States and Canada, whether there are local uh, um, laws. Um, how was it or what was the or how was the challenge resolved in terms of using water for development? I guess that's because it's a shared resource. So how are those kinds of issues resolved? Yeah, so I had um, spoken to the this, this concept of a boundaries water treaty. Uh, that was the partnership between the U.S. and Canada and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And so the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement with uh, um, the International Joint Commission, which was identified as sort of this, this uh, um, binational body uh, to advise the governments on the um, you know, actions should be taken in the Great Lakes. And so, I mean, that is the central uh, uh, mechanism by which uh, decisions are discussed and shared in, in through this Great Lakes uh, Water Quality Agreement. Uh, there are several structures in there. There's, this, there's also something called the Fisheries Commission to deal with fisheries issues. Um, and so on the water quality side, um, um, it's the Great Lakes uh, Water Quality Agreement, but then there's, there's, there's fisheries, there's also water levels uh, as well that so there's usually on any of the shared water there is a mechanism to um, sort of identify management actions and, and resolve any differences um, and then in Canada what happens is that uh, then Canada kind of forms that those um, um, that initial relationship with US but they know that there's a lot of some of these waters the jurisdiction is the province of Ontario so there is a process in which Canada and then the province of Ontario have a negotiation called the Canada-Ontario Agreement, and that sets up a, a series of uh, agreements about what actions are going to be taken. Um, and this is actually one of the areas where then there are opportunities for um, 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 program, um, organizations such as River Institute to um, propose contributions to that agreement where they, once that agreement is struck, they, um, there are opportunities for partners to, uh, to apply for funding actually to undertake projects that would, for example, being on the uh, river system to, to assist the governments in helping achieve some of these desirable outcomes. So that's an answer. I mean, there's a, it's a very complex question, and, and there's a series of uh, very overlapping and, and connected um, uh, mechanisms by which the U.S. and Canada um, work together on the Great Lakes and all boundary waters. In fact, the Boundary Waters Treaty is all boundary waters uh, across the U.S. and Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, whole bunch of questions for you, Jeff. <laughs> Um, this is from my co-host Dwight. You mentioned declining levels of legacy chemicals. 
is the fact that they are still present just due to the high persistence of these chemicals or are there still some sources of these chemicals getting into these aquatic systems? That's a great question because really this is, uh, this is uh, um, the result of, of ongoing research too is that to understand just where the sources are. So the prevailing feeling is that most of the, the, the large sources have been identified and, and through legislation, these legacy chemicals like PCBs, you know, they, they, they're no longer being manufactured and no longer be used now for many, many years. Uh, but so the number one reason why they still exist, why they're still a problem in terms of they, they're driving fish consumption restrictions in Lake Ontario, um, is because they're very persistent. They, they remain in the sediments, uh, they particularly accumulate in sediments and, and um, once in the sediments through food web transfer, through, you know, consumption of benthic invertebrates by small fish, uh, and then, you know, transfer up the, up the food web, lake trout, and, and, and each time they transfer, it in, increases in concentration through a process called bio, uh, biomagnification. Uh, lake trout in, in, the, uh, in Lake Ontario, uh, a prized uh, sport fish um, still remains in uh, with a high concentration or high enough concentrations to enforce fish consumption restrictions. Um, but the other thing, the interesting thing is, is while we believe that, you know, most of these sources have uh, been, uh, you know, actively active sources have been um, mitigated, there are these legacy uh, potential legacy sources. And maybe I'll switch over to mercury because this is the one that is an issue in the St. Lawrence in, in my local area. Um, so you have a, an industrial site that where um, mercury, tons of mercury was used because it was a chloralkali plant. And what we find when we, we sample the, um, the sewer catchment system, we do still find with, uh, that there are these trickling amounts of mercury that still continue to uh, exit through these sewer systems, even though there's no active sources, there is these contamination sources that are buried somewhere uh, along these industrial sites that still uh, show that there's elevated levels uh, being discharged into the system. And that is the challenge. If that is the challenge to identify those, system, uh, those sources and being able to remove them. So. Um, it's a, it's a, it is something that we still are, feel like there are some sources out there. Um, I can give you other examples, mostly because it's not active sources, but it's just the fact that there are these um, industrial areas, particularly where contamination has not completely been removed from it and can act as a way of getting into the system. Thank you. Our next question is from Dexter Dean. Um, what are some of the regular water quality monitoring protocols employed in the St. Lawrence River Great Lake ecosystems? And so I guess these are ones that are mandated by government or, or legislation that occur regularly. Yeah, so um, yeah, there, there are many, of course, the government programs undertake many monitoring um, and, and a lot of it's driven by, you know, this Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. One of the biggest ones is to understand uh, I'll, I'll speak to one in terms of understanding phosphorus uh, inputs. Um, and so Lake Erie is probably the poster child, especially the Western Basin of Lake Erie, which is susceptible to algal blooms and cyanobacteria blooms. This whole entire city of Cleveland was shut down uh, some, I forget now exactly how many years ago, but in the past decade, for many days because the water, uh, the, the, the intake water, which is the Western Lake Erie, was so, uh, had high enough cyanobacteria levels and cyanotoxins that it would have been harmful for human health. So obviously the um, phosphorus is a key nutrient there. Um, and so all of the Great Lakes, phosphorus is and nutrients are monitored in the major inputs uh, through a, a program and oftentimes they're partnerships. So it's interestingly enough, one of the, the um, that the government is reaching out in partnerships with universities. Um, and there's the Maumee River, which is in the States that discharges into Western Lake, uh, Lake Erie. And the, the uh, um, University of Heidelberg 
actually maintains the monitoring program and the government relies on the data from uh, Heidelberg to assess and put into their models for phosphorus loading. Um, there are the, the governments, um, both US, Canada, um, and through their agencies undertake wide variety of monitoring in the Great Lakes for toxic chemicals, again, nutrients, uh, and, and of course, there's also fish community. So there is a, a broad monitoring program that's in place. Uh, but, you know, I think partnerships are still very important. Um, and, and understanding what the data means is critical. One of the um, one of the programs that helps understand those, uh, those um, you know, try to put a focus uh, on understanding the data and understanding the processes that the, that, that the data is reflecting is through a, um, a program called the Coordinated Science Monitoring Initiative or CMSMI, where they actually rotate every year to one of, so it's a five year cycle and they rotate amongst the Great Lakes and try to do a focus year, really uh, fill data gaps and uh, put an extra focus on research on that particular lake. So in 2018, for example, Lake Ontario's international section of the St. Lawrence River was the focus. And then, the, um, and, and, um, uh, and so there was a additional work being done there to help augment the, the annual kind of monitoring that is done. Okay. Um, we have a number of other questions, but uh, in the interest of time, because we're actually at the end officially, I will ask just one more question. Um, but I encourage the others, please, to, if you wish, send me uh, your questions and I will forward them on to Jeff if he's in sure. um, So the last question is from Alan. Um, and this is based on a map that you showed. Why is stress on Lake Ontario so severe, particularly in the less populated eastern end of Lake Ontario? Yeah, so I mean, to start off with, Lake Ontario is the um, one of the most, although in general, it is one of the most populated uh, lakes in the system. The um, and, and so, but as you said, Alan, we we see that the most of the population is what we call in the Golden Horseshoe area in the western part of of um, of the lake. In the eastern part of the lake. Um, one of the issues is that it is more shallow than the other um, sections of the lake. So the sensitivity, there's a sensitivity index. And so uh, what you find is in the, in the eastern basin of uh, Lake Ontario, we see the impacts of nutrients. And um, I mean, the sensitivity is even greater because of this, the shallowness of the lake. The, the way that the lake works hydro, um, hydrodynamically. And so there is, uh, the graphic implies a, a greater impact, but uh, it, it's a result of those cumulative stressors coming in from uh, Lake Erie discharging and the discharge from the Niagara River into the Lake Ontario system. And then the cumulative impacts from all of the population and other stressors um, that exist in Lake Ontario um, and, and so this is where we see, you know, it's driven by that, um, the, the, there are some, uh, toxic chemicals that are unique to Lake Ontario as well. Um, uh, Myrex is one of them. So this is adding to the overall cumulative stresses in, in the, in the Lake Ontario system. There's also aspects, uh, like I won't get into it as much, but it's, it's the, in, uh, the amount of shipping. Uh, and shipping uh, that occurs in the St. Lawrence Lake Ontario system and the potential impacts of the shipping that uh, that would occur there. So um, it's a, it's uh, all of these add up and and create Lake Ontario as one of the most impacted of the Great Lakes. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, once again, I encourage those who ask questions in the chat just to forward them on to me and I will send them on to Jeff. Um, but thank you for uh, a wonderful plenary. I also thank Mrs. Harrison Smith for a, a wonderful plenary. Um, I think these were really excellent starts to this symposium. I also thank our, our uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario for the inspiring message that she provided. And uh, I thank my co-host, um, Dwight Robinson, for uh, 
his collegiality and assistance in organizing this. So tomorrow, we're going to start sharp at nine o'clock. I do encourage you to come just a wee bit early because we won't tarry. We have three uh, sessions of talks and I'm really looking forward to these. These are uh, young scholars from the University of West Indies and, and from Queen's University. And then I hope that you will hang around into the afternoon. We're going to have some breakout sessions where we're going to plot to or, or discuss how we might deepen the relationships uh, among uh, researchers and, and teachers at our two institutions. So I do hope that everyone comes back uh, and will help us to make this a, a wonderful and uh, rewarding first session of the Fulford Symposium. So thank you for attending. Thanks again, Jeff and Mrs. Harrison Smith, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow, I hope. Bye now. Bye now.